so how, how, how was your week until now? Um, it's uh, rather mundane, you know, just running the mill. You know, it's getting close to the holidays, so the spirit isn't always lively or um, upbeat, if that's possible in prison. But, you know, it's, um, yeah, I try to make my days, you know, positive, progressive, and, you know, peaceful to the, to the extent that I can. Uh, going to group, which is the NA group oftentimes, uh, where men are sharing the stories about their sobriety and their recovery, and uh, you, you get saddled with, you know, the feelings that they're expressing, but you try not to um, take on the emotion all the time, but we're human. So, you know, um, it happens. That's all right. For the most part, everything's been, you know, just mm -hmm. normal days in prison, if that's possible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Normality in prison. Well, <laughs> yeah. What what happens at the holidays in prison? Well, what's going on there? Say again. What 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 is the let's say is there any like like a celebration on on Christmas or, or what's going on in, in the prison on Christmas? Well, around the holidays, um, there are usually some type of uh, get together relative to the various religious organizations within the institution, be they Catholic, the uh, The Hebrew Israelites, the Jews, um, the Christians, the Muslims, but those that celebrate the birth uh, of Christ on the 25th, somewhere around those holidays, within the Christmas week or before, or soon after, usually before, they have some type of get together, some type of just celebration, nothing extravagant. Uh, just like yesterday, they just had a food sale for us where they sold. Uh, food that was different from the regular menu, which entailed whole chickens, uh, triple cheese burgers, uh, Philly cheesesteak, chicken cheesesteaks, and uh, yogurt parfaits. It's food that men could buy just to have on their own and um, something different around the holidays. But um, other than that, you know, things are regularly run of the meal. They're going to have a special meal, as they call it, or a holiday meal that the institution to give everybody within the institution, it'll either be the 20 or the 22nd somewhere that they'll pass out the meal. And it'll be, quote, unquote, the Christmas meal. It consists of two chickens, a ham, two little thighs. I shouldn't say two chickens. <laughs> two little thighs, a piece of ham, some mashed potatoes, some gravy, probably a piece of pumpkin pie, a little salad, and uh, some kind of fruit drink in the packet, and then they'll give us a sack lunch for our dinner, which would be two bologna sandwiches, four cookies, another juice packet, and that's about it. Mm. Okay. So, yeah, and so, yeah, uh, on they're, they're, then they'll lock us down. So <laughs> when they have a holiday meal, they feed us. <laughs> To give us a quote unquote special meal and then they lock us down. A lack of huh? what? Like, a lack of they, what? They do a lockdown. They secure the prison basically. After lunch, they secure the prison. Everybody's locked down to the next day. Ah, okay, locking like, down. Wait. Yeah, it's like, it seems counterintuitive. Like, this is supposed to be the holiday to celebrate. You just gave us a special meal. After you defeat this meal, it's almost like they traumatize everybody. I'm like, what the heck is going on? And why why do they do that? Because they they are afraid of 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 some um, violence. Not or? necessarily that 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 necessarily that they're afraid. It's just that they it, it makes the orderly running of the prison better. They can have a basically an amended day. It cuts the day short. They may be short of staff, and they don't have to worry about people celebrating. And as I said, they don't have to do too much. If everybody's locked down. It's less staff or security that's necessary on that day. You know, men like to do certain things around holidays habitually yeah, all their lives. So men in prison would like to do those things too. Or yeah. the staff, so they can have a, a a skeleton crew, so to speak, on the holidays, knowing that it's going to be, after lunch, it's going to be locked down. So, yeah, it's, um, and okay. it's been like that since I've been here. Today. So it's it feels funny. somehow, it feels somehow sad that, that like, They lock you all down, and then they go out to to their families and and have their Christmas Christmas Eve. Well, I don't think they leave the prison necessary. I think just most a lot of people don't even show up to begin with, so they're short of staff usually around the holidays to begin with. You see a lot of a lot of the officers working a lot of overtime. You see a lot of the same faces repeatedly, mm -hmm. even during the shifts where they don't even work on 
tells you that they're, they're not fully staffed. So they're always operating under capacity as it relates to the officers. So on the holidays, it, it becomes even more exacerbated, I would assume. Mm. People calling off to do things. But generally, let's say Christmas falls on, excuse me, a Thursday. They're going to take Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off. It's going to be the Christmas weekend, so they're going to have a four-day weekend, a four-day holiday. All of those days basically going to be the same. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's kind of, there'll be no work, and you'll only go to child and back to your unit, or you'll go to recreation. But um, all work will be cut out. So yeah, it'll be essentially what they call a modified lockdown. So the days will be different. All of those days that they call a holiday weekend. So yeah, so uh, mm, okay, I understand. <laughs> Uh, and tell me, Ari. Um, now, now I know you're you're in this dormitory, and you can go to the to this room where where you can meet or you be in a common room. But I remember yes. when when I, when we all saw this documentary on the BBC, you were in the single single room in the single cell. And, yes. Um, so, how how many years have you been in that single cell situation? Well, I'll just say that I've been in the dormitory eight different times over the course of my stay here. So all other times I lived in a cell house. So I would approximate that my total time within the dormitory would say, I would say, let's say 10 to 12 years maybe at the most. Okay. So on the rest, I wouldn't it, say that. the I, rest was in the cell house. I would house. say 10 years. Yeah. And yes, is it, the rest of it was in the cell house. And and did you feel it to be in a cell house as a privilege or is it more like the dormitories is the better place? What would you say? The dormitory is always considered a privilege because you're not locked in a cage and you have a certain level of mobility that you don't have. You're restricted from by being locked in the cage in the cell house. Yeah. So you always have access to the shower. You always have access to the day room when there is not lockdown. You have access to other people. You have a certain amount of uh, give and go or get up and go. Uh, like right now, I'm on the phone. If I was locked in the cell, I have to use my tablet until they open the door. I could get to the wall phone, but I can co-mingle and in, uh, interact, socialize with other people at all times. Yeah. Um, yeah. When there's not a lockdown, so yeah, yeah or even, even when there is a lockdown, just by being in the dormitory. So yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's incredible. So but, what, yeah, it's considered a privilege to live in the dormitory. Okay, and, but and, and it's and all you, about you. Hmm? No, tell me. It's all about your mindset. Some people don't want to live in a dormitory. They don't feel comfortable living in an open space around other men while they're sleeping. They don't want to shy with other men, and they want their level of privacy. That that is afforded to them by living in the cell house. So, and and how is it about you? What what did you what did you like more? Or were the different phases in your life? Well, it, it really came down to the phases that I've been. Sometimes I didn't want to live in the dormitory. Well, I don't go in the dang dormitory. And that had to do with a lot of things that I was into or what I was trying not to have other people see in terms of my behavior, you know, which wasn't, you know, I don't want people to know that I'm involved in this, this, or this, which was not necessarily good. Like I may be involved in, in ingesting something or uh, doing something I shouldn't have been doing. So I wanted my behavior to be covered up. And yeah. the uh, cell house allowed that an anonymity. Just by simply pulling my curtain, wearing the dormitory, you wouldn't be afforded that privacy because someone could always see you. Yeah. And if you engage in something you shouldn't be engaged in, some rule breaking or some illicit activity, then you could be discovered uh, or informed on or whatever. So yeah, it really had to do with my evolution as as, as a as a man and what I wanted out of my quote unquote prison stay and my life moving forward. So now I don't have a problem living in the dormitory because I've. I've Giving up all illicit activities, I'm not into nothing nefarious, and I'm, I'm I'm an open book essentially, so I can live in the dormitory because yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I don't have anything yeah. hiding. Okay. So yeah, when I was a young man, I didn't I didn't want to I didn't want other people to see what I was doing, you know, be yeah. all in my business, quote unquote, as yeah. if I had some. <laughs> Understand? <laughs> okay, whatever young man men's do, yeah. Okay, and yeah. <laughs> And um, so, and in the time where you were in the single cell, yes, um, <clears throat> have you? You have one. Okay, so we, we continue after that. Have have minute you, remaining. 
have you have you um is it was it really the rhythm 23 hours in the cell and one one hour out or something like that or because i, I remember you were in this cage outside playing playing basketball or something like that so yes was yes. it like that in in that the seclusion when i was in on that unit yes it was 23 and one that was an administrative segregation unit and i was put there for disciplinary reasons okay. under those circumstances yes you are secluded 23 hours a day and you have one hour of recreation out and that's where you recreate that by yourself in that cage okay so you you, you had also some disciplinary issues as well and during your time as a, as a young guy was how, how was it well at the time that that was filmed which yeah. was 2012 i had out my, my location where i was working at the hospital where i worked i had i had been uh discovered having a cell phone in my possession oh and i had been sanctioned Thank you for using GTL. Okay, interesting story. <laughs> so let's wait for the next call. So he had a cell phone in his position. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> okay, let's see. Hopefully call soon. Hello, this is a prepaid call from an inmate at the Indiana State Prison. To accept this call, press zero. To refuse this call, hang up or press. Your current balance is $33.62. This call is from a correction facility and is subject to monitoring and recording. Thank you for using GTL. Hello. Hi. So here we I'm are back. back. Yes. Very good. So I was saying that I had been discovered with a cell phone at the time, and uh, I was ultimately put in the cell house for uh, six months. Okay. Behind uh, being discovered with a cell phone, but what ultimately led to me being in there, over and above me having a cell phone, was me working in the hospital. Another individual, or there were other uh, extenuating circumstances that essentially allowed them to say, "Yeah, I'm a high risk of security breach. Breach. Of, I'm high security breach." So they said I needed to go to DC House. In addition to being caught with the phone, a nurse over there had been caught uh, leaving the prison with a copy craft bear that she had been given by supposedly someone uh, in the prison. So them not being able to identify who and her not being forthcoming and saying where she got it from, they said, oh, there's some trafficking going on. So that, uh, along with the discovery of the phone, they said I needed to go to D.C. House. So I stayed in D.C. House for six months. During the course of that time, I was in D.C. House, that seclusion. That's when they filmed that expose. Okay, I understand. And that's maybe the, uh, the reason why, why you got on the film, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have yes. been on the movie. That That's that's so somehow a, a, a good chance for you, hmm? Well, they had already had that set up even before I went to D.C. House. Had I not been put in the D, they would have filmed that expose while I was working in the hospital, and the context would have been different, or at least the infrastructure of the place where I lived would have been shown different, because I would have been actually in the dormitory that I'm in right now. The last oh, time I was in the dormitory that I'm in, I was actually taken to lock up to that place that I was in from this dormitory. Yeah. So the irony. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> oh, so okay, okay. So this means that you have been chosen already for the for the series before before. It was not like by chance that that uh, Sir Trevor McDonald just passed by and so oh who's this young young man let's talk or something like that. So we're choosing no, already. No. No. It was okay. it was already been set up in advance. Okay. Understand. Okay, very good. Um so um, this means that that was a very special place. So how was is, how is the normal life in a normal cell house look like? Well, well, in a normal cell house, I always say that you go to you go to work, wreck, chow, and you go to the cell. Essentially, every day you're going to come out at least three times a day to go to chow, and an additional fourth time to go to wreck. If you have an, a job, then the there's a bit of nuance in it. But at, at the very least, the default setting, you're going to come out three times to go to child. 
Mm. Most of the times when you come out for child, recreation is ran during the times that you go to child. Either going, with the exception of breakfast. When you come out for lunch or dinner, your recreation be, will be ran simultaneously while you're going to lunch or while you're going to dinner. Except at breakfast, because we go so early, you go to breakfast, you come back, and then you wait for rec if you have rec that morning, which will probably be two hours later. Okay. Other than that, so so if you have recreation in the morning, that means you'll come out four times in the day. You'll come out for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then you'll come out for rec. Okay. If you don't have rec in the morning, you only come out three times, breakfast, okay. lunch, and dinner, because rec will be ran during lunch or dinner. The nuance is if you have a job, you will be out in between breakfast and lunch and in between lunch and dinner to go to work. And mm-hmm. work happens between 7 in the morning until uh, one forty-five in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. Some jobs run longer, but other than that, that's for the most part, from 7 to one forty-five. And having having a job is a privilege, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And and do you get do you get a salary for this job? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. <laughs> but I get it. I get it. A salary does work. You get a stipend. No, you get state pay. You get paid monthly for the hours that you work on the job, essentially. And I guess as long as you work on the job, I guess it would be a salary. But, you know, a salary, I would assume, is you're going to get paid this much for the whole year. You're going to have to maintain your job to get that money. So, And you get paid a month later. You have to work a month before you even get your first check. So if you get fired a month later, you still get a check. Oh, okay. After being fired. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of works in reverse, you know. But yeah, um, it's um, wow. So yeah, it's um, everybody gets paid for the job that they do, that they work. The pay varies according to the job that you have. But and as I said, some jobs work a little longer than others. But if you work in the kitchen, it's still eight hours a day. You may go to work at twelve in the morning and get off at nine, mm-hmm. or you may go to work at nine o'clock and get off at five. Yeah. If you work the yard, you can start work at 6.30. You can get off until 1.45. Yeah. I was a fireman. When I was a fireman, we were always on call 24 hours a day. Yeah. Uh, anytime there was a 10.70, um, we had to respond to it. Go to the fire station, uh, don our gear, and be prepared to respond. So yeah. some jobs, recreation jobs, you work from 6 in the morning all the way until 5 at night. So you're out all day. You even count at your workstation. So some days a little the job that I had in the hospital I worked from six in the morning until five at night mm-hmm. you know, so a um, couple of jobs are just the nuances are a little different but for the most part most of the jobs are from seven in the morning to 145 yeah so tell me a little bit how, how is a job in the hospital what what are you doing do you work like as a nurse or, or what what are you doing in the hospital? <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, you're a porter, you're a janitor. You're responsible. You're responsible for the maintenance of the the the, the, the building. Uh, you sweep, mop, you clean up. Uh, if something happens, they respond. When a, if there's a medical emergency, you clean the blood off the gurney, okay. uh, reset it, uh, restock it, and have it prepared to go out again. Um, essentially, that's mm-hmm. basically the job. You're a maintenance man. When I worked in the dental clinic initially, my first time working in the hospital, I worked over there twice. When I first started in the dental clinic, I actually used to not just clean up. I would used to help uh, bag and autoclave the uh, dental utensils, uh, the elevators, the awls, and uh, different things that they used to take the teeth out. I would autoclave them and actually bag them up. So I would to, uh, to sterilize I'd everything. deal with the sharps. Con- yes. Yeah. I would deal with the sharps containers. After the needles, after they had uh, cut the needles and put them in there, I would take them to the biohazards, bag them up, make sure they got to the place where they were going to be disposed of. I would help make the uh, the stone replicas of um, the teeth that were, um, I'm drawing a blank here, <laughs> the stone of impressions of teeth uh, in preparation for people to have dentures made. They would take impressions in the lab. They would bring them to me, essentially. I would pour the stone in them, uh, mix the stone, pour the stone in them, uh, put them on the shaker, um, take up uh, the uh, impressions off of them, and wait for them to dry, and then bag them up, tag them, put all of the work that the uh, information needed for them to go to the lab, box them up, and have them wait for them to deliver them to the mail room. Yeah. So 
in terms of the dental clinic, that was my most extensive job. Yeah. That was the thing where I felt I was most involved, it, having it sounds, been involved in that process. Yeah. Okay, it sounds like a technic, technical assistant job. We we have this this type of job. Oh, it was, it, yeah. it, as it relates to helping with the teeth, it was in, yeah. in that capacity. Of course, I couldn't do any operations or be involved in any of the dental work yeah. itself. But once the dentist clean was done, I literally was taking the trays uh, outside of the sharps, the needles, anything like that. I would take the trays with the utensils on it, the dental utensils on it, off of the, the chairs, take them to the autoclave or, or take them to the solution, put them in the solution, then autoclave them. When they were done, bag them up, and they would restock them on, in the, the shelves themselves. But, man, it was, uh, it was quite interesting. I learned mm. a lot. So you, this, this, was this your favorite job so far in, in, the, in the prison, or I, I would say I would say uh, working in the dental clinic and being a fireman. I, I would say also being a tutor probably were my favorite uh, uh, jobs here in the prison. Which one was the last one? Being in the being a tutor. Yeah, I was tutor. a tutor in the school at one point in time. Okay. Yeah, but then too, I don't know. Right now, I'm, I'm a recovery coach here within this, the unit that I'm in, and the job that I'm doing is not geared towards me. It's about serving other people and helping other men in their lives, basically, and helping them uh, find a way to save their lives and being a part of that process. So that being of service to them gives me a great deal of gratitude and a lot of humility. So I don't, I don't know. Dental clinic, fireman, tutor, recovery coach. Yeah. I think I think I would have to give it to the fireman and the dental clinic as the top two, probably. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fireman, tell me a little bit about that job. What, what what was the job as a fireman? Oh, as I said, uh, we had to we were tasked to be on, on call 24 hours a day. If there was a 10 say, 1070, a signal that an alarm had gone off, we would have to respond from our unit, run to the firehouse, don our gear, and wait to be tasked with orders. If, in fact, there was a fire that we would have to respond to. Uh, short of that, each Saturday we trained to be able to do the task, to be able to respond to whatever uh, cell house, whatever uh, problem that arose within the cell house. We had to um, uh, attack the fire hydrants. We had to run water to the place that we needed to. We had to use the pump truck. Uh, we had to uh, work on uh, slushing the holes. We work on uh, taking the holes up steps, up the steps. We work on preparing ourselves, donning our gear, uh, working in teams. Um, having a span of control of the men in the field. It was just a number of things that we would do in training to be efficient at the job whenever there was a, a call for us to um, respond to. So he had, uh, And there were the chief of the fire department for Indiana, the Department of Correction, trained us to be certified firefighters. We were actually certified firefighters accredited with Uh, certificates from Homeland Security, and we had public safety numbers on record at Homeland Security. If there was a, a federal emergency hazmat situation anywhere in the United States, we could show up and be tasked to help ameliorate, ameliorate or clean up the problem um, accordingly. Yeah. Mm, okay. So, but however, being felons, uh, there's not we, getting jobs in society as firefighters was limited, except to a voluntary. Uh, fire department, and it was up to the chief of, um, if they would allow us to um, serve in that capacity. Yeah. But we were firefighters nonetheless. Mm, okay. And have you ever have you ever had a real fire to 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 work yes. on? Uh, yeah. Wow. 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 It's, uh, man. Yeah, 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 man. There was a number of cases, three occasions in particular. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, let's not talk about it on this because I'm. Uh, yeah. um, I died burned up above me, man, in 2017, man, and uh, he burned to death, yeah. and I literally watched it in the mirror, man, and so it's, uh, it's traumatic, you know. Yeah. It's um, not being able to help that guy because of the incompetence of the people who were working at the time, man. Just uh, mm. man, guy lost his life senselessly. You know, unnecessarily. It's, um, it's, um, it's tough, man. But there have been three incidents where there were actual fires where we had to um, literally don gear and put the fire out. You know, so. Um, so um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Right. Okay. 
Okay, I see. Maybe we'll, we will we will talk about that uh, when, when you're free and then we have Yeah, have let's time. revisit it. Yeah, let's then talk about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, then let's let's go to another subject. Um, Ariel, I would I would like to know a little bit about I would like to understand or to imagine yeah. how, because I, I, I understand you're right, you, you did really studies. You have a bachelor degree in, in a certain thing and even, even an advanced degree. So how do you do that in prison? Do you get books or do you get, I don't know, uh, uh, video, video teachings or how does it work? Or do teachers come into prison or? Yes. Well, at the time that I was going to, To, to college here in the, in the facility, the uh, my alum, my uh, the college that I graduated from is Grace College. So I'm alumni of Grace College, uh, which is in, in Winona Lake, Indiana, and they considered the facility a. Sac you have one minute remaining. Wow, they considered the facility a satellite campus, and the teachers would, the professors would come to the institutions in a central school building and they had classrooms in which we would go to and uh, be lectured for our classes essentially. We also had access to a library uh, on a computer and we could request various items from the library at the college through request slips basically and they would love the books to us but for the most part we would go to the computer lab and do our work. But yes, we studied in class for whatever time the class took, whether it was 50 minutes, 60 minutes, however long, and the teachers would come to the site. Yes. So, so you have like a like a school building on the on the prison campus. Yes, okay. they actually had two school buildings. Actually, one was for college uh, yeah. and uh, various continued education courses, and the other one was for GED basic adult education program. Is this is this normal in in U United States for for high security prisons? Thank you for using GTL. Let's wait for the next. I hope I can do one, a third one. I hope Ariel can can call me another one. Let's see. It's very interesting today. Not so philosophical like the last times, but uh, more like about the real life. What's really going on? It's really interesting. Okay, it seems that he can't call back a third time. So, dear listeners, I um, thank you very much for taking part here, for following us, and for recommend the channel to your friends so that it grows, so that we help Ariel in his life. Thank you very much and take care. Thank you.